I'm Jenna Siri, a bookseller and associate producer of Poured Over, and today I am so excited to be joined by Nina St. Pierre, who is an essayist, a writer, has been featured in Elle and Harper's Bazaar, and I think about a million other places <laughs> over the years. And I am so excited to talk today about her new memoir, Love's a Burning Thing. This book I pretty much devoured in one sitting. I couldn't stop once I started because the the story just rolls. Once it starts, there's so much there and it has so much movement and there's so much to connect to. It's really something special. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here and I appreciate that introduction and I'm glad it pulls you through. It really does. There's so much and every time I would think I would have like a grasp on where I was at, In all the best ways, something would happen and I would think, oh, of course, but also I could not have ever seen that coming. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's how life is in so Mm -hmm. many ways. We think we know all of the things that could possibly happen for us, or um, we think we have a handle on who we are and who others around us are. And yet there's always surprises. That's yes, to put it politely. (laughs) I was hoping to have you start and uh, describe the book a little bit for our listeners and just set up the story a little bit. Sure. Um, so there's there's the story and then there's sort of a prologue. I wasn't sure quite how to integrate that initially, but I think it's information you need at the beginning. When my mother was 20 years old in 1971, she and another woman lit themselves on fire in a dual self-immolation. Um, it was a suicide attempt in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, they were rushed to the burn unit where my mom was there for six months undergoing surgeries, skin grafting, blood transfusions. The other woman died a couple months later, um, but six months later, my mom emerged and went on to become a teacher of transcendental meditation. So that's kind of the like information you need to know. Growing up, I didn't know that my mother, I I didn't know anything about the story. I just knew she had been in a fire because she had burn scars over most of her body. There was that. And when I was 12 years old, she told me the whole story, but that's a different scene. (laughs) Um, So I come in and basically it's a story about her raising me and later my younger brother as a single mother in California, we moved around constantly and she was a seeker. She was really seeking enlightenment and she sort of moved away from traditional religion and was pursuing all these different forms of new age spirituality. So we moved around a ton and she was always kind of like looking for something more. And we settled eventually in this small town in deep rural Northern California called Mount Shasta at the foot of a mountain she had heard was cosmic. That's why we went there. And while there, all these strange things started to happen. Um, And as I came into my teen years, I started to think like something is wrong. Something is off. The reality that my mother is describing, which is one that includes, you know, astral travel and sort of other dimensional worlds is not squaring with the world, the daily life that we're living. So through a series of events, it's hard to put it in a nutshell. (laughs) Um, Toward the end of her life, there's another fire. And after she dies, I kind of look back and start examining and researching my own life and saying, wait a minute, who starts two fires? What was really going on? And I kind of come to the conclusion on my own, that my mother was, I believe, living with paranoid schizophrenia that was masked or exacerbated by deeply held new age spiritual beliefs. There's a lot there. I know. I'm sorry. I'm trying to work on a nutshell explanation. (laughs) Well, but how do we elevator pitch a life and an existence and an experience? I think it's It's hard. It's hard. And there's a lot of heavy topics that you tackle. There's mental health and who has access to mental health care. There's so much in regards to class and it's sort of the way that it holds us in certain places. There's religion, there's sort of these 
spiritual groups that often lead into conspiracy. There is so mm-hmm. much there. And yet it is so propulsive of a read. It doesn't ever feel like heavy or weighed down to a point where you have to say, you know, I can't keep going. But I think that comes often in memoir. We have this ability. You have a line in the author's note at the beginning that's memoir is not an autobiography. It's a curated work of memory. And that really set for me the tone of what this was going to be. A hundred percent. I think people, it's interesting. I want, I think about how much our job as writers and authors is to educate the general reading public about, you know, of course, as writers, we have our own ideas about genre and and what it means and what the, what the specs are of genre. But I, I think often, you know, the general reader picking up a book, when we say this is true, there's, there's, at at times this expectation that it's an investigative journalism piece and people don't, I think still totally understand that, that memoir is very crafted, (laughs) right? It doesn't mean it's untrue. It means what we're really striving for. And I know what I was striving for is to capture the emotional truth of an experience. And you do that so well through bringing us really into your life and into your feelings. And it feels like sort of you're telling us this, like we're sitting in a living room and you're telling us this story. And you do sort of bolster it with these, you have a lot of quotations from other works and other things that I think really draw in this connection of, this is a bigger picture that you're touching on with a lot of these things. And yet it always comes back to the personal and to what you have already experienced and known. I think that's important because I'm not an expert on any of these things. As you say, the the book touches on many topics, uh, you know, mental health, incarceration, self-immolation, which has a deep complex history. And my background is as a a reporter, a journalist. So I had those tendencies and actually early in early drafts of this, it was much more reported and people kept saying, okay, that's great. And I thought, oh, aren't these things so interesting? I'm so interested in all these ideas and all these sort of like social and cultural kind of nuances. And, and I want to explore that. But then again and again, the feedback was, where are you? This is your story. I thought, my story? I don't want to talk about me. (laughs) So it actually was a process over many years of being pushed to put myself on the page more and to really center my story and not kind of spiral into outside research. Because that, I guess, for me, to be frank, was sort of a comfort zone. It is a very vulnerable thing. It is the most vulnerable thing, I think, in many ways to offer up your life and say, for better or worse, here's the story and and leave it to the readers to sort of take what they will, especially when you're dealing with topics that are often stigmatized and often criticized by those who maybe don't have access to as much knowledge or haven't been shown certain things in, in realistic or positive lights. I think especially when it comes to the representation of mental illness and those struggling and especially those who don't have access or aren't interested in access of care it mm-hmm. really shows i think for people a mirror that they might not be comfortable with seeing yeah and i mean it's such a huge there are just so many ways that people you know i'm not it, it's it's sensitive to write about mental illness particularly about someone posthumously who was never officially diagnosed. So a lot of this is speculation and conjecture on my part, which was, you know, validated in part by therapists that I had worked with and sort of research, but it's, it's sticky. (laughs) And many people, as you said, um, it's not just about, you know, who's diagnosed. It's, it's, it's sort of autonomous, autonomy of treatment, you know, people, a part of the story and a part of what I'm trying to get to with my mother is like, that was her prerogative to choose how she was having the experiences she was having, but the way in which she framed that or chose to treat it or not was her prerogative. And that's ultimately what I 
want for all people, but we have to have better systems in place to support people's autonomy to create the lives that they want. (laughs) Definitely. There's something that I think we aren't often presented with that, even as an option that someone may be able to make those choices. So often we see either a villainization of people who remain what I guess society would say untreated or they uh, are not interested or people have a sense of needing to care for others to take away their uh, autonomy, to take away their rights of choice, because we feel like we have to care for others who may be experiencing that. And I think that's something that as we move forward and as we gain more knowledge about what these these, uh, conditions really do for people and how we're it may not, what we've been doing may not have been helping as much as we had thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what you said to your point about there's kind of the either, or it's like, you're either in need or you are villainized. So you're either kind of like, you know, yeah, the, the victim or the villain. And those are really, especially with women historically and in many other, you know, marginalized groups, it's just those options are no longer working. I mean, they probably never did, but I I feel they're really played out now. And what I hope this book does more than anything is, is push for nuance and push for complexity. I mean, I think one of the things I really was considering when I first started writing this, you know, and this was talking about things that happened 20 years ago, So even in the course of writing this book, my understanding and perspective on these things has really developed (laughs) and is more sophisticated. But I think my initial exploration was really, was it mental illness or was, did she have access to kind of spiritual metaphysical realms? And through the writing of the book and, you know, the years that, that passed, I became less interested in that question and more interested in what does it look like or what would it look like to address mental illness within spiritual communities? And (laughs) what would it look like to bring spiritual possibilities into clinical understandings of mental illness? So it's almost like it's not either or, but it's like, what does it look like to allow all these things to be true in both of these realms? And that is something that, that really feels radical. I agree. I think the idea of not only allowing people to live the lives that they want and that they are living and that they choose, but also that society may have to accept things look different than than we've seen before and that we we haven't done what, what we've needed to do for these people. And often that comes with, like you said, support, especially in the communities like in Northern California, where there is a huge class disparity and there are very many people living in, you know, poverty situations where not only is there an increased stigma often about these things, but there's just no access to the resources that people may want or need. Definitely. I think that, that, the the resource is is a big is the big word there you know and thinking even more about when we say oh are people resourced so often i think that's sort of a stand in for just money but there's so much more to it than that and even thinking about okay how was my mother resourced in which ways was she and was she not how was i resourced and in in our cases i feel like it really came down to community and what conversations were allowed and what were not. You know, my mother was found community that sort of, in a lot of ways, confirmed and affirmed her beliefs. And so that, in some ways, I think was probably very um, supportive and, and powerful, you know. So she was surrounded by, if she says, oh, I'm ex- I'm astral traveling, I'm having these interdimensional thing. And, and the community around her is also has those beliefs and lives that way. She's not constantly coming up against people refuting her reality. (laughs) But then I'm over there like, well, (laughs) I didn't feel that I was resourced with people who 
whether in, you know, friends or, or family or sort of the larger community of like, you know, teachers, counselors, things like that, that I had places to go and say, Hey, I'm hearing this, but this, I'm, I can't square it with my reality. Like there was nowhere for me to say all these things are happening and I don't know how to make sense of them without what I felt like at the time in a crude way was like getting my mother in trouble. So I think that when we talk about resource, it has to be beyond just like, you know, can you get social services? Can you get money? Can you get a counselor? But like, what conversations are you safely able to have without having your family, your livelihood, at times your life even threatened? There is so much more than we are often willing or able to look at because it is a challenge for most of us, we will never experience so many of these things. And then to have to say, well, that could happen, but it doesn't really happen that often. But I think something that was coming to me as I was reading was that realistically, these kinds of stories, though there are extremes, they're happening all the time, especially as we're moving forward. I mean, this sort of concept of new age into conspiracy pipeline, I think is even just becoming more and more and more prevalent and more concerning in a lot of ways as it, as it sort of filters through the internet and filters through Instagram and Facebook and all these other things. And there's a growing sort of thing there and it's going to touch a lot more lives than, than we think coming soon. I agree. I've been trying to talk about this, not even just in this book, but kind of Um, I don't think I had the language to articulate it, but I've been trying to talk about that sort of collision of of the, especially kind of the conservative thinking and where that converged with um, conspiracy thinking. And I mean, it was, it was a sort of unique combination that I was surrounded by in rural Northern California and people didn't quite understand. And I felt like there's something to this and It wasn't until QAnon and all that blew up where people started seeing the relationship or kind of the merger of like the yoga wellness mom with the kind of like anti-vaxxer conspiracy and then conservative or not even conservative. I would say kind of like the don't tread on me libertarian. Those things all came together in sort of a public forum and people were shocked. And I thought, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is what I've I've known. And, and I agree. I think that particularly as, I mean, if you read also about conspiracy thinking, conspiratorial thinking in times of deep mistrust of government, of kind of the systems that are supposed to hold us, people have historically turned to the esoteric, um, turned to sort of magical thinking, turned to conspiracy. And so I think that as we feel more and more destabilized as as a nation, as a a globe, these conversations are going to become more important. So I totally agree with that. And I think it's important to start um, acknowledging them And even if you don't believe it, there is importance there and it's going to be culturally relevant. So we should begin. (laughs) I think, I know for me, a uh, a good opening door was like Amanda Montel's work with Cultish and the Age of Magical Overthinking that just came out. Those are like easy to palette, like Mm -hmm. ways to Mm -hmm. see some of these like cognitive biases or fallacies that come up again and again. And Mm -hmm. it really opens, when you start looking at it, you start to see it everywhere. (laughs) Truly. I just went to see, um, Amanda at the strand actually, um, for her launch and, and she has a way of kind of containing it and putting it into a sound, but you know, she's very, she's very good at what she does. And I think a lot of, I'm, I'm so appreciative of her work because I think that it's, like you said, it's a great foundational kind of primer to even begin to understand some of these things. I think that I take the complexity of some of this stuff for granted sometimes. I mean, even talking to you, it's so interesting. So I'm like, okay, I need to make this tighter. But the thing is, it's very murky and it's messy. And so I'm really excited that Amanda's work is in the world and that it's getting the attention that it is because I think she's she can lead 
lead the people to the, <laughs> you yeah. know. Once you start sort of turning over rocks and seeing some of these things, especially in these like small communities where there's a lot of capacity for things to sort of pressure cook and for things to get really intense. And then to sort of expand it out, if you look at like the sort of the ways people use like Facebook and Instagram to Mm -hmm. spread everything out, there's just so many avenues you can go down and so many like deep dives. When I start Googling stuff, it's all bets are off as to how long (laughs) I'm going to be in there. Yes, better (laughs) you than me. But I've been there. I've been down many a a internet wormhole. But something that I really appreciated in this work that I think I was glad to see was there was how much compassion you have for the other people in the story that though the story is focused on you, obviously it involves so many of your other family members of your friends and the way that you treat their stories is so respectful and caring that it really made me feel connected to all of them too. And I know that it's one thing to be vulnerable and write about yourself, but I imagine to also have to include other people is a pretty daunting thing. (laughs) Yes. Other people (laughs) in my mind, when I, when I started out, you know, I was like, this is between my mother and I, and not in a, not in a beef beefy way, but Mm -hmm. you know, this is between her and I, this is really our story to work out. And because she's not here, which was both pro and con in some ways. I mean, this, the book wouldn't exist if she wasn't here. I would have never done this. Not because I needed her to be gone to say it, but I would have had no impetus for it. Some early drafts really didn't have other people. I mean, other people were there, but they were kind of like stick figures you know, because I was really protective of them, particularly my brother, who I still feel incredibly protective of. Um, And I didn't, I was like, this is not about them. I don't want them to be on the line. They didn't ask for this. They just happened to know a writer. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, that's not life. We're not created in a vacuum. And to talk about how and, and why I didn't understand what was going on why things played out the way that they did. I had to talk about our communities. I had to talk about the support and conversations that were and were not happening. And so, you know, people also had, readers also had to push me like, okay, we know you don't, you know, want to really go there, but you know, your brother is a human being. He needs to be animated. So, you know, what I included about other people over time sort of expanded and contracted. And I I hope that I landed on a a balance that feels okay for people, but it really is, there's no way to write this proper without talking about my dad, without talking about, you know, my brother or the communities that we were in. That's just, you know, but it's, yeah, you just cross your fingers and hope everyone's not going to hate you. (laughs) But there's, I, there's no, I mean, it's, it's, it seems simple to say, but there's no villain in this story. There's no person that comes off so bad or that, you know, it's like, okay, here's where the problem was. Everyone with their problems or with their struggles, there's still so much, you you know, you understand there's compassion, there's heart behind everyone as well. That means a lot to hear that because I, I mean, villains are not interesting anyway. (laughs) Right. In a memoir, you know, no. in certain context, they're great. Fun, <laughs> sure. You know? Right. If you're, if you're reading, you know, some fantasy book where you have to have that, but I think most people recognize in real life that there is not a bad guy and there is not a good guy. It's just, you know, we're all trying to get through in the best ways we can. And especially in ideas of family, I think sort of the concept of family mythology and family world building are so interesting because you sort of pick apart the layers of saying, okay, here's me and here's my relationship to this person. And then I, there are some moments where you're like, I had to remember that, you know, not only did I have a relationship with my mom and my brother, but they had a relationship separate as well. And sort of watching you uncover that connection is really meaningful to read. That's so interesting. Yeah. I think like 
you know, someone had asked, okay, well, what was your brother doing when you were gone for those summers? And it's like, oh yeah, there was this whole world. And there's a way in which family in this, and I mean, this is kind of uh, not a main point, but maybe a sub theme is family in this story is so fragmented that it, it's like, I experience each, each kind of member or unit of my family in this very siloed way. And so I think, you know, ultimately what I'm hoping to do is kind of bring them together in sort of a collage or, you know, a kaleidoscope of, of family, but even, even finding that at the, you know, end of the, toward the end of the book, I find a journal of my grandfather's, um, that was my mother's dad who I didn't know well. And he writes about, um, going to the hospital and seeing my mother, her uh, part of when she was in the fire, she lost her outer ears. So just like this part, the part we think of as ears, you know, (laughs) um, and he writes about seeing that and kind of losing his mind and flipping out on the hospital staff and going home and kind of drinking himself into oblivion. And it was so profound to read that because I felt to your point of like considering the different types of relationships that I wasn't a part of, that was a really, I don't know, in some ways a really grounding and edifying experience because my mother's first fire was something that was in the past. It was sort of a prologue to, to our lives. She never talked about it. We weren't closely connected with her family at all. Um, and she raised us in the West and we just didn't know much about her family. It was very disconnected. And so at the end of my search, when I'm looking back on this story and I'm trying to, to think about her and our lives and I find this journal and it was like, oh, wow, we could have been connected over this. And this, these are the family members that immediately experience that, this thing that I'm here alone trying to think about. Okay. And it really it, it sort of connected us through time. I think that's something, I mean, it's interesting in one way that it was through a journal of your grandfather's mm-hmm. that you found, because I think that's something that writing can do so well for us is that connection through time and connection through space and connection through so many disparate things of, you know, someone reading this, even though they may have never met you and know nothing about your life. And now they have a connection to your family and they may have something where they're like, oh, okay. Now that that makes sense for me about my own life, Mm. I think that's something Mm -hmm. in writing that is so incredible and why we read and why we write to have that communion and connection. Yeah, that's that's a really beautiful way of putting it. I think that there's something very restorative about it. It it, it really restored me. <laughs> I feel like again there was kind of all these fragments of family, of history, of narrative and kind of putting them together. It's not that this is the conclusive ultimate narrative above all narratives, but for me it was a way of kind of gluing it all back together and saying, "Okay, I made a thing." <laughs> and yeah, I think that people, you know, lots of my my colleagues and fellow writers who write nonfiction memoir, there's kind of a stance, you know, memoir is not therapy because reader, the casual reader might be like, oh, this is, you know, kind of it's your journal entry. And it's like, no, it's not. I mean, I think that most people know it takes time and craft, but there is sort of a stance against particularly for non-white writers, for women, femme, queer writers, that, yeah, just that it's not, it's not therapy. But I find that the practice, instead of saying it's therapeutic, I do think it can be restorative. I agree. I think looking, especially as you know, you're able to go through all these different stages of your life and you've been writing for a long time and it has served different purposes for you. You know, it was sort of an escape for you in a way to be able to Mm -hmm. make a career and to, you know, use something to push yourself forward and to do these different things. And you've had such a great career as a writer so far and to then have this sort of be like the next stage or the next thing. It's it must feel, even though it's not therapy, you know, even though it's not like, okay, I processed all this through writing it, you know, there is an accomplishment and a sense of, you know, a chapter in this. A hundred percent. It definitely feels, I mean, in some ways I did, uh, uh, this began as me processing. So (laughs) 
I was never really in the memoirs, not therapy <laughs> camp, but I understand it. I understand yeah. it. And ha- having spent 10 years elevating my writing to be able to even tell the story as I saw it, I a hundred percent, it's not therapy, but it really did begin as a, as a processing for me. And, and you'll see there's a, there's a short passage in the book where I talk about starting to write it. I didn't want it to get too meta and eat itself, <laughs> but but it kind of pours out of me the first draft in this one year that I sit down and I have a typewriter and I just write every day and I'm trying to understand what has happened. You know, this is post my mother dying. And when I read it back to myself, it was like reading a novel. It was like reading someone else's life story. And I thought, oh my God, how dissociated was I from these experiences? I mean, it was kind of surreal and shocking, so um, I think that then the the process of kind of like taking that into something that was going to be a crafted piece of work and a, not just a part of my career, but actually sort of a bridge to a new type of career was an interesting, I mean, that's like a whole other conversation. <laughs> And it wasn't really intentional, but I think that looking back, it was, it was, if, if things are fated, this was, was a part of, of my fate because it became, I told someone, a friend the other day, this book made me a writer. I was writing before, but it was very, I was working for, you know, magazines, local newspapers, doing some reporting, but I was never going to write about my life. I had no interest in writing about myself as this became a story that I felt really compelled to tell, not just for myself, but for others, I thought I have, I'm not a good enough writer to write what's in my mind and how I see this story. So the potential of this story was always the bar and it became like the thing that I was chasing. And then some, at some point it became my life. (laughs) I love that though, because I think So often I hear from people, some of my friends who want to write or whatever, that they think that if it's not, if if they can't just spit it out, you know, then it's not their story to tell or, you know, all those things. And I think like there's, that just simply can't and isn't true. Yeah. I think that's kind of goes along with this myth of, of the kind of the genius or, and that's a really, that's really damaging because I used to have sort of an aversion to people when you would go to readings or something and a writer would be like, oh, it just, I don't know, it just flowed out of me. And I was over there toiling for 10 years thinking like, <laughs> not just flow out of you. But now, you know, I've, I've had so many different experiences writing this. I, I understand that more that there is a sort of flow state. There is sort of a grace. There's sort of a, a, an underground river you can tap into at times. And once you're in it, you go and it really does just come out. But I think that the idea that writing does not require hard work and a lot of it, and that you have to be develop craft and skill. It's not just inspiration and flowing and vibes. I mean, it, it, it's a craft. Mm -hmm. So I I think that any ideas that, that kind of diminish that are, are harmful to artists especially people who aspire to, to write you owe it. The the vision you have is like the the carrot. (laughs) Right. And you're always moving towards that and there's always room and there's so much. And I think if we said no, like only these people, I mean, we, we have had that where we've said only these people have stories worth telling or only these people Mm -hmm. have stories to tell. And then, and we now, I mean, that's just not true. We've, we missed out on so many stories Mm -hmm. through history that we'll never know. And, now there are still so many people clamoring, I think, to have their their stories recognized. But hopefully as we move forward more and more, we're, we'll be seeing those. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> I have to ask, since we're talking a little bit about making this as a craft thing, um, some of your influences in writing or some people that you come back to over and over. Yeah, I would say particularly with this book, um, I, there were many, you know, I was writing it over a 10 year period. So I think that there were many different, you know, like phases of that and things I was influenced by, but books off the top of my head that I returned to again and again. And I feel like we're really foundational in this book. And 
as this book is the book that kind of made me a writer, I guess, in my formation as a writer and a thinker. Lydia Yuknovich was, you know, pretty primary. Uh, Lydia Kiesling's The Golden State, um, which I don't know if you've read it, but it definitely, it explores that same sort of area that I'm writing about, which is a very rare region to be represented in literature. Esme Weishun Wang's The Collected Schizophrenias, um, Kate Zambreno's Book of Mutter, which she called in an interview, I believe, her impossible mother book that took like 13 years to write. And I thought, I'm writing an impossible mother book. <laughs> so that was really, you know, galvanizing. Insensorium by Tanais, um, which is an incredible book about the um, history of scent and colonialism. It's just really profound. Uh, and let's see what else. Gold Fame Citrus by Claire Bay Watkins. Anything that's sort of like California and deserty psychedelic really, Amazing. really inspired me a lot. <laughs> um, also, a Cueque Amezi's Freshwater, which is fiction, but something about the way that um, that they wrote the embodied it's sort of a, a story about a, a spirit and um, the embodied and the grotesque like gave me a lot of permission. Uh, I could go on. We the Animals by Justin Torres, one of the best openings of any book. Yes, I think it just begins. We wanted more, and that's it. You just get chills, you know. I feel like that's that's always the thing. We could, I could always sit and when people ask me this question, I'm like, oh, I could tell you. <laughs> 8,000 books. You, that's like, don't even like, ask. Just go on and on. Yes. <laughs> I wonder, do you have a, a sort of perfect reader for this book or someone that you really hope finds it? Yeah. So interesting because I almost feel like the, the question you asked sounds like one, but to me, they're two. Okay. It's like the perfect reader is, is I have an intellectual and egoistic answer for it. Okay. And the person that I hope finds it is who I really wrote the book for, you mm -hmm. know? So there's like mm -hmm. my artistic ambitions, my ego, yes. my brain, and then there's my, my heart. And the people that I wrote this book for who I really hope find it are people who are, you know, frogs in boiling water. Like they don't, there, there's something they're trying to figure out. There's something they're grasping. Maybe they're dealing with, um, you know, a situation like mine where there's, you know, maybe undiagnosed illness in the family, maybe for some other reason or situation, um, there's secrecy or shame um, in their family or, you know, communities that that is keeping some truth cloaked from them. I agree. And I think that there are so many people that will get so much out of this, whether they're coming to it for the memoir aspect, for some of the mental health representation, whatever I think draws them in, there's going to be 15 more layers that they find as they read through because there's really so much there. So thank you so much for joining us today. Love is a Burning Thing is out now and I can't wait ever, for everyone to get their hands on it. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to meet you and just, I really appreciate the thoughtful questions and being able to be in conversation with you. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're gonna recommend a couple of fantastic books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Love is a Burning Thing. I market my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, but I'm really gonna give the reins to my two very favorite book buddies. I've got Jamie in near Kansas City, and I've got Donald in the Detroit area. So Jamie, I'm gonna go ahead and let you kick things off and I'm just gonna pop out for a moment. Sounds good, Mark. I'm recommending except a memoir by Emmy Netfeld, which is now available in paperback. Um, I think on a basic level, these memoirs are both about a daughter raised by a mother with mental illness, but each of them serves as a reckoning really of the systems that can fail children in those types of dire circumstances. And Emmy's memoir follows her from her childhood in Minnesota where she was raised by her troubled mother after her father's gender transition led to their divorce through the foster care system to Harvard and finally a stable marriage and a job with Google. We think it's 
story like that. And we think about that ending. And that means that we're going to hear about how she's overcome adversity and pulled herself up by her bootstraps. But that's really not the story that she's going to share with us at all. She's here to change up our notions of grit and of determination and overcoming um, everything as we hear about in so many popular memoirs. Emmy's mother is a hoarder. Okay, so she grows up with all of these things pressing in on her, and she, of course, dreams of escape, and she sets her sights on the Ivy League as the place she's going to escape to. Her mom believes she's exceptional, but she really can't break up with her own destructive behaviors or through the bounds of poverty to kind of help make this happen. And Emmy ends up in foster care. She ends up in inpatient psychiatric treatment and eventually homelessness. And despite that, and despite the adults and the systems in her life failing her, she does persevere. But it's, it's not that simple. She says often what she would do is escape into her own ambition. And now that she's on the other side of it, and she's got this great job at Google, she's got this relationship, she's going back and examining every bit of this story with candor and sometimes with very kind of dark humor. And she'll inspire us and then come along and knock down all of the kind of Cinderella story conventions that are out there and talk about how when she's at her most successful, that's when she's at her most vulnerable because she's just terrified of losing everything because that's how she grew up. She knows everything is just one step away from disaster. So she feels this tremendous pressure to be the best survivor, you know, to be the best version of a survivor out there, a person who overcomes and really through that lens, she learns how to let us come behind the wall with her and see that these things, you know, this just doesn't always work. It doesn't add up. Had the systems that were supposed to support her and protect her have been in place, she wouldn't have had to overcome, right? But she did. And now she has to figure out how to kind of be content with being that person, even when it makes her angry. So I think this is a book that if you're a fan, um, certainly of The Glass Castle or of Educated or any of those memoirs, you're going to find a lot to like here, for sure. But I think the the point of view is distinctive, and that's what makes it a really special and powerful book, the kind you're going to, you know, shove into people's hands after you read it. Again, that is Acceptance, a memoir by Emily Netfield. So, Don, Donald, what have you got for us today? You know, looking at Love is a Beautiful Thing, I wanted to look at the mother-daughter relationship part. So what I found was Traveling with Pomegranates by Sue Monk Kidd, um, which is kind of a part autobiography, part travel memoir that she did with her daughter, Anne, um, as they traveled through Greece and France. But why I picked that one along with Love is a Burning Thing is, again, it's about mothers and daughters individually and as a family unit, but it shares some themes with that other book, uh, especially undertones of the relationship dynamic, you know, coming from a religious background, Suman Kidd is also known for writing some religious books as well. It also has a little bit more positive look at mother-daughter relationships, but yet still fragmented. There's still moments where they don't get along and they have different viewpoints. And it's about how they find their unique individuality as a family, as a mother and daughter. It also has this interesting undertone of the mythological characters of Demeter and Persephone. Um, so anybody who knows a little bit about mythology will pick up on some of those nuances and how that challenges both Sue and her daughter into being better people, being better support for each other, and that spirituality that they develop. And the last part of it that's really fascinating to me is that some of the history around this book was she wanted to take a travel with her daughter because she was having some problems coming up with how to interweave bees into a story, which... For a lot of folks who know Sue Monk Kid, ended up being a secret life of bees. So that was a very positive trip that she took with her daughter. So again, that was Traveling with Pomegranates by Sue Monk Kid as a great tie along with Love is a Burning Thing. Excellent. Thank you both. I know to always expect great recommendations from either of you. And you always come through. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead and make the rounds. Jamie, uh, where can we find you and your store on socials? I'm in Kansas City. I am at BN Plaza KC. Excellent. And Donald, where can we find you? You can find me at BN Fairlane Green. All right. Thanks so much, both of you. Thanks for tuning in to Port Over. That's all the time we have right now. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. 
You can follow Barnes & Noble on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Very simple. Thanks for tuning in and happy reading. Have a good one. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.